Welcome everyone to this introduction to quantification in PET and factors influencing PET quantification. In this lecture, I will give a general overview of what quantification in nuclear medicine and specifically in PET means, and will give an overview as well over factors which influence the PET quantification in clinical practice. So let's start. Nuclear medicine uh, imaging is based uh, for PET spec all modalities at the same principle, the tracer principle. That means one takes a biomolecule, which is specific to a functional or metabolic process. One wants to uh, assess and uh, one then labels this nuclide, uh, this um, biomolecule with a radioactive nuclide in case of PET positron emitter and injects or brings it into a patient. Then that biomolecule distributes in the body uh, according to its uh, properties and the radiation arising is uh, from the decay is then measured by the positron emission tomograph and from that data one can reconstruct a three-dimensional distribution of the tracer. Now after one has these images one can uh, do different things uh, and the most common is uh, one does the reading of the PET images in a quantitative or in a qualitative way. Uh, qualitative interpretation of images means uh, that actually one uh, visually assesses the tracer distribution. Uh, one example for that is, for example, the most common staging where one uh, searches for the primary tumor and then sees if there are um, lymph nodes involved or if there are also metastases. So that's a qualitative interpretation that's done not only in PET, that's done in all uh, nuclear medicine imaging. Um, systems, so for SPECT and gamma cameras as well. Then uh, there is another way of uh, reading PET images. Uh, that means one does a qualitative, uh, quantitative interpretation. For example, one uses something like a standardized uptake value for example for therapy response assessment. That means one quantifies the tracer distribution. And how did exactly work and what that means, I will explain in the following. So nuclear medicine, just uh, in general, I just want to um, make everyone aware that whatever I say about quantification actually is true for all nuclear medicine uh, systems. The gamma camera, at least parts of it, but for SPECT, SPECT CT nowadays, even does quantitative and also PET. So most of the things uh, which you will hear the next hour uh, will be applicable also for SPECT, SPECT CT imaging. So how can you quantify um, nuclear medicine imaging? The simplest way of quantification, which was done uh, for decades, is uh, to look at the tracer uptake in a target structure and compare it to a reference. And one of the simplest way of doing that is comparing left to right for uh, organs where, which have a symmetry, like if you have two kidneys left and right, you can look the uptake left in the kidney and right in the kidney. Or uh, where this is also often done is in the thyroid, that example you see here, where you look at the left and the thi uh, right thyroid lobe. Another way which is quite common is uh, to assess um, a quantitative tracer uptake relative to a reference organ or a normal collective. So reference organ, for example, would mean you look at uh, the uptake uh, in comparison to, for example, the liver, more than the liver, same as the liver, less than the liver. You can do that visually, that works quite well. And also, especially if you do... Um, um, brain imaging uh, using norm collectives. That means, the example here, that's a normal brain. You usually build up a normal brain out of a database of 10, 20, 30, 50 healthy patients. Uh, and then you compare um, a new um, acquisition with a reference to the normal collective, and you quantify the differences in terms of uh, how 
how many standard deviations from the norm collective year away from the average value. And uh, last, uh, simple wave quantification can also be relative to a reference uh, standard, for example, a phantom or something, which was often done in planar imaging. Not so much in uh, PET, but one should mention that quantification can also be to a reference standard where you know exactly how much is in much activity or tracer is in. Now, uh, as we have PET CTs nowadays and also SPECT CTs, uh, one uh, can uh, also do a real quantification of the tracer, so without a reference. And that works when one does all corrections, so attenuation and scatter correction, um, which can be done for SPECT and PET the same way by using uh, the data uh, from the PET and the SPECT and then applying uh, the corrections according to the anatomical reference. So either the CT from the PET CT or SPECT CT or the MR in the case of PET MRI. So that works quite well in all cases, um, a little bit better for uh, CTs than for MR for attenuation correction, but below the line one could say that actually all state-of-the-art PET CT and SPEC CT systems are uh, delivering a quantitative assessment of the uh, tracer content, tracer um, concentration within an object as long as the systems are properly calibrated. And that means quantitative in a physical sense. So what these systems are delivering is actually in a physical sense, the absolute activity concentration in each pixel. So like Becquerel's per milliliter. Good, so that's often quite enough for a physicist because of Becquerel per milliliter is an SE, that's SI units. Um, you can, uh, that's physical units where you really have some absolute quantification of the activity distribution within an organ, within an object. Now, the problem starts with that actually what uh, the medical doctor, the patient, uh, nuclear medicine wants to do is not really quantifying the physical activity concentration within an organ. What actually is wanted is a quantification of the functional process, the quantification of the metabolic activity, for example, in, a, in an organ. And this is actually not the same as the activity distribution. Uh, to do so, you usually need dynamic measurements or let's say that way, if you take a patient and you inject a radioactive uh, compound into the bloodstream, then first it will be only in the bloodstream and then it will be taken up from the bubsing, uh, bloodstream into the different tissues. And depending on uh, the pharmacokinetics behind, this will go faster and slower might be reversible and so that means that the tracer concentration in organ is depending on the time and as such actually not really a measure of metabolic activity so what we actually want to know is how fast the tissues are taking up the tracer and what they are doing with the tracer so if it's stuck there if it's sent back to the bloodstream all can happen and just to give you an overview um, about the journey of a tracer through the blood, we have uh, here a video from a total body PET system. The lower part, you see a white spot, which is the tracer, which is injected into the venous system. And if that happens, then actually the tracer is going through the venous system. It's going to the heart. It's going then through the lungs back to the heart and then distributing in the body. And with time, that tracer is then taken up with uh, different speeds in the different organs. And if it's in the different organs, 
it may be going back in the blood that's maybe also organ dependent the tracer is maybe metabolized and uh, in the end there is a different radioactive molecule inside the blood which is not the tracer anymore and distributed differently and maybe there are some other things happening so all these things need to be taken into account if one wants to do a proper quantification of a functional process or a metabolic process and to do so if one wants to do it correct, one needs to do kinetic modeling, so pharmacokinetic modeling that works as follows. So first, one really needs to understand what the tracer is doing in the body. So what is the pharmacokinetics of the tracer in the body? And this is then described with a pharmacokinetic model. For example, something as uh, you see here, uh, that's a two tissue, com uh, two tissue compartment model where you have uh, blood concentration and you have transfer constants from the tracer from the blood to, for example, the cells and then into uh, some metabolic process in the cells. Uh, that metabolic process might be reversible, that's the K4, and the tracer can also be expelled from the cell itself again back to the blood and depending on the process that k4 may exist may not exist and may this uh, model is much more complicated so it really depends on the tracer the pharmacokinetics of the tracer so if one has that then one can describe that mathematically in differential equations and to solve this uh, whole thing and to get all these transfer constants in a mathematical way, what one needs to do is uh, dynamic measurements. So one looks at the tracer concentration in different tissues and the blood, and then fits um, functions which solve these differential equations to the data one has. Now, sounds quite straightforward. The problem is a that we often don't know the exact pharmacokinetic model. And B, which is the more important problem in practice, to do so, one needs uh, kinetic, so dynamic measurements. That means usually one hour of measurement. One often also needs blood sampling because one needs to know the activity in the blood, and then it's often hard to get uh, from the images, pet images itself, due to partial volume effects. And one uh, needs to know metabolites, if metabolites exist, because the metabolites do not take part in the uh, pharmacokinetic process, but they give a signal in the PET, so to correct for that. And after all that, one also needs personnel who's doing that kinetic modeling, which is usually an extensive post-processing step. So below the line, doing kinetic modeling means a lot of work and a lot of time, which is not feasible to do in a clinical setting. So pharmacokinetic modeling is mainly used in um, scientific studies or in uh, pharmacological studies, but almost never in clinical practice. So only for very rare cases. In clinical practice, one actually also wants to know the metabolic activity of a specific organ or um, the functional part. And one came actually to a quite simple and nice solution of doing so. One estimates the metabolic activity using the standardized uptake value, the SUV value. It's quite a um, widely known value. And the standardized uptake value, as said, is an estimation of these metabolic activities, of the size of this transfer constant. And what one is doing there is one takes, uh, one injects a tracer at a specific time point, x, so zero. And then after a predefined, well-defined time, for example, 60 minutes quite often, one takes a measurement. Because one says, okay, the organ has 60 minutes time, to take up the tracer and after 60 minutes I see how much tracer was taken up. So I can then measure the activity concentration in an organ and I know okay that tracer was taken up. Now that's a good estimate at the first but what one needs 
as a second parameter to get an SUV is also one needs to know how much trace was available because maybe one was injecting a little bit less, a little bit more. Maybe the patient was bigger or smaller. So uh, that in general, more blood volume, less blood volume. So the concentration was higher or lower. So for the SUV, one takes the activity concentration in the tissue at the specific time point that's here. And then one we'll normalizes to an estimate how much tracer was there in total. And this estimate is generally based on the injected activity because what is injected is there, normalized again to a body specific measure, which is usually the body weight. So it's the activity you find, activity concentration you find in the tissue divided by the injected activity per body weight. Instead of body weight, one can also use lean body mass or body surface areas, especially lean body mass has some advantages against body weight. But in general, it's, I could say the SUV value is the tracer in a specific organ normalized to a surrogate of the available tracer in the blood. Good, so the SUV is an easy solution to a complicated problem. And it is widely used, and that's a study uh, which was done uh, 2011, uh, in, uh, where a survey was done among 128 PET-CT centers about how they use uh, SUV values. And at the survey, 90% of the centers reported SUV. So in the patient report, they write in the SUV values. Of that, 90% are using the SUV for therapy response assessment. So that's the main use of the SUV value to see if a therapy works or not in a quantitative manner. And 30-35% uh, of the centers also use the SUV for distinguishing between malignant and uh, benign disease. And there were some other uses for SUV as well. So that sounds quite good. It's widely used, it's really widely used. Uh, the number didn't change the last 10 years from my gut feeling, so I think that's still the same. So that's a widely used um, value. And I have now here an example, for example, for discrimination between a malignant and a benign disease. So uh, that's an example on uh, malignancies in neurofibromatosis type one patients, so neurofibromatosis Mitosis type 1 is, these are um, tumors of the nerve systems. So actually growing tissue and it can be benign, but it can also be uh, malignant. And a way of assessing malignancy or if something needs surgery or not is doing a FDG PET CT. And it's published, there was a, it's a nice publication where it says, okay, you can use the SUV, in that case, the SUV max value as a cutoff to decide if something is benign or malignant. That's a very nice number, SUV of 3.5, above it's malignant, below it's benign. That's actually what a medical doctor likes to have because actually everyone likes to have because that's a hard packed threshold above or below. Sounds nice, sounds good. EGNMMI, the study is also a nice study published in a very well-known journal. But if you then look at literature, in another very established journal, there is another study, same year, which says for the same disease, for the same thing, that a cutoff of seven is good to define between malignant and benign disease. So that's different numbers. So now, Someone could say, okay, it's a little bit weird, so what shall I take? I don't know. And one searches the literature again, and one finds another study from 2010, which states 6.1 is the cutoff value. And if you look further in the literature, you come up with another number in Neuro-Oncology 2012, published 4.0 as the cutoff value. So that's a little bit strange. And if one looks at these differently published um, SUV values, one could think of, is it a standardized uptake or a silly useless value? And actually this question was already uh, asked in a comment in the Journal of Nuclear Medicine in 1995. 
So what's the reason why the standardized uptake value can vary so much? The thing is, the standardized uptake value is a nice thing. It's an easy solution for a complicated problem, but that also means that SUV is depending on a huge variety of factors. So there's a lot of things in the whole workflow which can influence these SUV values and these technical, biological, and physical factors. And I will now just go through some of the samples to give you a hint what everything needs to be taken into account for a proper quantification. Just besides, if somebody is uh, interested in that topic to uh, have a little bit more in reading, can recommend the publication standards for pet image acquisition and quantitative data analysis from Ronald Bullard, published in GNM in 2009. Most things I will say here are also depicted in that nice overview of factors which can influence um, pet as the SUV value as a means of a pet quantification. Good. So, technical factors. Technical factors which will influence the SUV value, for example, the relative calibration between the PET scanner and the dose calibrator. So, the SUV value needs the activity measured by the PET system and your syringe, what you injected to the patient, and that's usually measured in the dose calibration later. So if these two devices do not show the same activity distribution, if they're not in calibration, then this mistake goes directly in the SUV value. Another thing, for example, which is some kind of a technical factor is if there is some activity left in the syringe that can have an influence uh, on the SUV value. Typically influence number there is like 5%. It's quite commonly that a one, two, three, four, five percent are left over in the syringe. Another thing is clock synchronization, um, an activity concentration or an activity without a time is uh, worth nothing because we're working with quite uh, short-lived isotopes. That means we also need a time. And that means if the clocks are not synchronized between the dose calibrator and the PET or whatever clock one uses to assess the times for the activities, uh, then uh, this also directly translates into the SAV value. And also what sometimes is, which comes together with time is that the injection versus cal cal calibration time is messed up. So that can also uh, be typically maybe 10% error. And in the end, also the quality of the administration. And what it meant with that is that all the activity uh, which is expected to be in the patient should be in the venous system of the patient. So the, blood system when you inject it. And if there is a mistake in uh, injection, so that parts of the tracer is going paravasal, so not in the uh, veins, so maybe um, in the muscles besides the veins, then this is not um, cannot be distributed in the body and therefore also um, is, not, is not regarded as available tracer. So that also influences, can influence the SUV values. That's for example, if you see an image which is, seems like there is almost no uptake and somewhere a hotspot on the hand, then the SUV values usually do not fit anymore because uh, there was a lot of tracer deposited in a small spot. Good, just an example. So I always have prepared an example so that this what I say is, can be seen a little bit more practical, uh, clock synchronization, and that's quite often an issue. If you have five minutes time offset between the clock you use for the dose assessment and the PET CT system, where you put in the numbers to calculate the SUV value, then that means if you have fluorine 18, maybe 3% offset in the SUV value so might be practically clinically still usable. But if you go to shorter lived isotopes like gallium 68 with 68 minutes half-life, it's already 5% error. C11 with 20 minutes half-life, 16% error. And if you look at very fast decaying uh, 
uh, very fast decaying nuclides like oxygen 15, then five minutes will already meet your 85% wrong. So in general, the clocks in a nuclear medicine department should be synchronized with all increments at all times. Okay, so that's an overview of some technical factors. There are usually more, but just some examples so that one gets a feeling uh, what that means. Another thing is biological factors like the uptake period, so um, the time between injection and the measurement, the patient motion and breathing. So if the patient moves, uh, it's like during the pet acquisition, it's like smearing the activity over a bigger area. That means your concentration is going down, which means your SUV is going down, even though the uptake would be higher. And also things like, I mean, blood glucose level for an FTG tracer, for other tracer might not be so crucial, but depending on the tracer, things like the blood glucose level can have a big influence because if you have a high blood glucose level, then maybe your cells are already saturated with glucose and they will not really um, take up much more glucose. So the FTG, for example, will then not go so nicely into the tumors. So that can also change the SUV readings. And that's biologic. And as an example, just because it's a nice example, I have the uptake period. So uh, that's from a publication from 2006, where you see time activity curves of FTG uptake in different tumors. So each line here is another tumor. Most of them somehow have a plateau after 50 minutes. So they don't change too much, but there are some tumors which just all go on taking up FTG. And if you look at these three tumors and you would do after 50 minutes the measurements, you end up with an SUV of 10. If you do it here after 75 minutes, you have an SUV of 13 for the same tumor. And just because of these 15 minutes. That's 30% more in SUV. And if one may remember the persist criteria, that's criteria to assess if a disease is stable, is progressive, or um, therapy is working, then that persist criteria says if the SUV is changing more than 30%, then there is a change in uh, the disease. So if it's more than plus 30 percent it's progressive disease it's less than minus 30 percent the therapy is working and if it's somewhere in between then it's a stable disease and just in that case in these cases of these three tumors that would mean that just doing 15 minutes delay in the imaging could already mean that that patient uh that that patient would be called a non-responder, that it's progressive disease and that the therapy will be stopped. Even though actually if the third measurement was done at 50 minutes PI and it's still the same tumor, it actually would be a stable disease. So uptake time can make a big issue. So a standardized uptake is very important. And uh, that's also easily written in some, it's called, standardized operation procedures but in practice that's a big issue to really uh, get that done correctly and i have here um, data from uh, 70 ftg pet ct scans from a um, center where 60 minutes pi is the um, prescribed imaging time so officially they do 60 minutes pi plus minus 10 minutes and that's why I think, okay, this is done. But if you look at the data from the DICOM data, the injection times and the uh, imaging times, then you see that actually you have a quite nice nearly Gaussian distribution. The mean is rather at uh, 70 minutes than at 60 minutes. And you have a spread, and some of those even were done 100 minutes PI. So in clinical practice, to get, a, let's say, a very exact post-injection time is really hard to achieve because you're dealing with patients which are usually quite ill and old. And uh, some of them are cannot walk well. Um, you have other... Uh, organizational issues sometimes it takes longer to find a wean so in general 
and in practice, if you manage to have it 60 minutes plus minus 10 minutes, and if you manage to, let's say 90% of the patients are in there, that's really a good number. So it's really hard to do that in practice. So then we come to the last two physics related factors. So if one wants to put that up that way, so there are factors like the scan acquisition parameters, like usually like 15% influence on SUV values. The image reconstruction parameters can influence the SUV quite strongly. So especially the SUV max, the mean is not so uh, affected by that. And also the average in a big uh, homogeneous organ usually also doesn't matter too much the image reconstruction parameters, but for small like tumors, uh, image reconstruction can be a uh, big influencing factors. But also the use of contrast agents, which can cause um, impetity uh, artifacts or region of interest definitions. And just to come back to our neurofibromatosis type 1 patient, I, to give you a nice example of what that means, like such technical factors. Um, we did a study uh, about neurofibromatosis type 1 patients, and we pulled data for from more than 10 years from our hospital. So uh, I was uh, 11 years. And during that 11 years, we had two different PET CT systems. So uh, when doing the evaluation of the data, uh, we found that actually the data which was coming from the old G advanced PET system are systematically lower than uh, the SUV values we got from a newer uh, PET CT system. And uh, the statistician was like, okay, what's going on there? Is there maybe a change in the patients? So we were thinking, okay, why is that happening? And the first thing, I mean, one could think of is that maybe the systems are not really aligned. So what we did is we used a NEMA image quality phantom. We filled that and we took the same phantom and once put it in the G advanced system. And uh, also in the Siemens Biograph and the new PET CT system. So, and that's what's coming out. That's one image quality and the other. Also, it's nice to see how the image quality changed with generations of systems. So it's getting better with time, which is good. And then we fitted some lines through the data and we saw that for an average lease in size of 1.5 centimeter diameter, we have approximately just a systematic offset because of these two systems of 23%. So that means for these different sphere sizes with the field post reconstruction filtering used, with the reconstruction algorithms, with the different crystal sizes, we ended up with 23% difference in quantification with these two systems, which we had in the same hospital and which partly were even used in parallel. So when we um, corrected that, we actually ended up with a nice, the same SUV. And I'm sorry about that. It seems like that this slide is now just not working, but I can assure you, we used the uh, phantom data for correcting for that. And actually we could use the data set in the end. So if you know the differences, you can also somehow bring these systems for, let's say, general uh, evaluation studies again together. And unfortunately, such problems are not only problems, uh, not only problems we had. What we did in 2014 was we did a multicenter study in Austria where we went to all PET CT systems at the time we had in Austria to do NEMA image quality measurements. So some kind of like an EARL study where we use the same phantom in different systems. So actually in that case, the studies were done all by the same person. Actually, I was doing all the scans. Uh, so I went to all the hospitals, filled that cyst, that phantom, always the same way. So no inter-observer variability and used the standard protocols and some adapted protocols. And the outcome was each of the points here is a different system. 
is that we had a big spread. So for example, the recovery coefficients were going from, for um, a specific sphere sizes, we're going from 50 to 150%. Or uh, for the biggest spheres between, let's say, 90 and 140 approximately. So that was a big spread in quantitative values. And what you see here, that brown um, brown uh, lines are the recommended spread of um, quantitative accuracy, uh, which you would need for uh, comparing results. That was in Austria in 2014. And uh, when we look at the data we had in Austria, that's our data here. And we compared that with a Europe-wide study, which was done for the EARL accreditation, where we compared in Europe different PET-CT systems. Then actually what was coming out that is you see exactly the same. Here, spread what we have in Austria, what we have in the rest of Europe. It's so that's not a national, that's not an individual problem from a hospital, that's not a national issue, that's a Europe, a worldwide issue. So, depending on how that system is set for the quantification of like these smaller lesions, uh, the different system can be quite diverse. In that case, a bad news. The only good news is one can align these systems if one knows his system and if one knows uh, how to tweak it then actually by using a harmonization harmonized protocols for example according to earl I mean one can do that on his own by his own or to another hospital sometimes it does not necessarily need to be earl but that would for example be a program or for doing so, if you harmonize these systems and if you um, align a little bit of reconstruction um, protocols, then one can align also the quantitative values of the systems quite nicely. Good. So that's a quick overview about like factors which are influencing uh, PET quantification. And actually, almost all of these factors are known. So uh, and uh, they're described and for the different tracers and the different examinations also um, guidelines exist on how to do that right and um, how one should set that there are a lot of guidelines from the european association of nuclear medicine the european society of radiology the european college of radio the american college of radiology the society of nuclear medicine north america so there are a lot of guidelines and for a lot of specific uh what's called uh, examinations tracers different purposes so uh they're also quite good i have to say so one i can really recommend that for uh the different examination one goes through the guidelines reads the guidelines not all the guidelines tell the same for the same examination, but they're good for understanding the process and then to adapt them to get standardized, harmonized procedures in a whole, so in his own hospital and for his own PET-CT and examinations. Good. So the take-home message is that for a proper quantification in pet uh, the whole workflow must be taken into account. So really the whole workflow, because it's not only the technical part, so the machine which needs to be calibrated properly uh, to be quantitative, uh, the patient, the personnel, the reading, everything needs to be into account to in the end really get a good diagnosis and a quantitative reading of a metabolic activity. So that was the overview. And now uh, as the last part, in, I would just like to quickly go for the example of SUV through that specific steps you have in a patient journey in such a, let's say, for an FTG PET CT examination, what you, with examples, what everything needs to be taken into account to get in the end a good uh, diagnosis, a quantitative reading. 
And all that, as I said, the whole workflow needs to be taken into account. It starts actually way before a patient is arriving in the hospital. So the whole workflow starts actually already with the patient instructions. Fluorid desoxyglucose, FDG PET, needs specific dietary requirements. And even these dietary requirements are different if you want to do a heart scan or if you do an oncological scan. Because uh, you with this diet, you set the metabolism uh, differently. The heart can go on glucose or on lipids. So that can be uh, changed by a different diet. So these patient instructions need to be already good and the patient needs to be informed what will happen because what the patient is doing before he arrives in the hospital can influence the quantification and the outcome of the study and things one could keep in mind is for example for an fdg study that there should be no food or sugar for at least six hours prior injection some guidelines say four hours but there should be a diet before so to keep the blood glucose level low as we heard before if you have a lot of glucose in the blood already then the additional glucose of the fdg may not taken up very nicely by the tissues uh, adequate prehydration for example is also quite important so um, that for example you give one liter of water at least that the patient is drinking enough water that's to ensure a sufficient low FTG activity in the urine because if you have a lot of FTG in the bladder that might cause artifacts it's also radiation safety more uh, water in the body also um, gets out the tracer faster and which is also important for example is keeping the patient warm 30 to 60 minutes prior FTG administration to avoid that uh, brown fat brown adipose tissue can be activated if it's cold and to prevent this activation because that can lead to wrong readings blood glucose level should also be measured just hoping it's low it's not always uh, sufficient for example, you say, okay, I need it below 100 milligram per deciliter. If you have uh, patients which are um, diabetic, you may uh, need to give some additional um, medication like insulin or something to set that right. It's also always good to check the body weight of the patient prior to examination because uh, body weight can change during treatment. The patient may not exactly know his weight and uh, each mistake in the weight because it's in the formula for the SOE will go directly uh, into the SOE. So if the weight is wrong, the SOE is wrong. And what is also always good practice to measure the residual activity in the syringe. So after injection, you there's mite activity left and uh, that should be checked because if you have 10% of the activity left in the syringe, it's not in the bloodstream, your SAV would be 10% wrong. If you know what's in the syringe, you can correct for it. And here I just took an example we once had a look at. The patient weight, as I said, it's good to measure the patient weight and not just ask him. So in that study, we ask patients to tell us their weight to put it in and that's the common practice uh, in most facilities and then we took the patient and put them on a calibrated weighting scale then we were looking what is correct and that's the outcome 175 patient on average the patient knew their weight quite well minus two percent but some of the patients were more than 10 percent off with their weight and you see they usually report a lower weight than they actually have and 10% wrong in weight means 10% wrong in SUV value so let's say two three percent wrong that's no big issue in practice but this 10% 13% they might become problematic so just an example asking the patient for the weight may not always be the is let's say waiting is better than asking good then if you have the patient you gave him good instructions 
uh, he was doing diet. You prepared him well uh, during uh, when he arrived at the hospital. And then you inject the tracer. And then the patient is put somewhere for 40, 60 minutes uptake time. So this patient preparation administration is also crucial. So it also influences the SUV. For example, again, uh, the patient should be kept in uh, comfortable uh, post the FDG administration. So uh, he should not, especially he should not freeze because that could activate brown adipose tissue. Or also if he starts to shiver, uh, the muscles are activated and will eat up the glucose. And which means that then in the muscles, you will have the FDG and not where you want to have it. That's um, a bit of a problem for quantification, but more of a problem for the reading of the images so that you might oversee some hot lymph nodes but they're covered by hot muscles. For brain studies, uh, it's for example, also important that the patient is not reading or watching TV. So I have no example on that, but I saw that already that if you let the patient, for example, watch TV, then uh, the eyes are watching and the occipital parts of the brain are processing that information and then they need a lot of glucose in that areas and you have a hypermetabolism in that areas. So you see if the patient was reading or watching TV during the uptake time. Uh, what's always advisable is uh, to send the patient to the toilet shortly before the acquisition because uh, then you get the bladder empty and you want the bladder empty. You don't want a high activity or high concentration, what you would see here in the bladder, because that A can cover a disease which is near the bladder and B will uh, can cause artifacts, color artifacts. And as we said already, the acquisition should start 60 plus minus five minutes after FDG administration, plus minus 10 minutes. But as I said before, in practice, I have to admit that's really hard to achieve because some of the patients, yeah, it's patients and not the machine. One needs to somehow deal with reality. Good, and I just have an example that you see how something like that looks like. That's the same patient one time so actually that's from a study that's a volunteer one time this uh was a normally treated uh, kept warm comfy uh, uptake period and in that case here on the right side uh the volunteer was freezing so it was cold during the uptake period and all that stuff you see here all that uptake is actually brown adipose tissue which was activated and started to produce um, heat from sugar and therefore took all the tracer and something what you see here as well nicely and that was not with the um, cooling that was because of the maybe different dietary uh, that volunteer looked like you see here the heart is not taking up or not really a lot taking up uh, FTG. And in that case, the heart is running fully on glucose metabolism. So here the heart is really full with glucose. That's an um, issue of dietary uh, before the scan. And for a heart examination, you exactly want to have that. If you're searching for a metastasis near the heart in the mediastinum, that's not a good idea because you might not see a metastasis, which is, for example, here near the heart. You would, it would be hard to distinguish. So, as said, depending on uh, it's called your protocol and what you want to have, the patient preparation and the things are very important. Good. And then we come to the PET-CT examination by itself. So the PET-CT examination also, we heard before, the technical factors mainly can have an influence. And here things you should keep in mind is that the injected activity and acquisition time should be appropriate. So 
cross calibration and uh, time synchronization. Uh, ah, sorry, with that the injected activity, you should have enough activity injected to have enough statistics and you should do a long enough scan to also get a decent image because if you don't have enough counts, um, you will have problems with noise and the interpretation visually will be not good and the quantification is also uh, getting worse with uh, more noise. Reconstruction settings need to be standardized. So for a specific examination, you know, set the protocol and don't change it because changing the reconstruction protocol means changing the quanti quantification of small structures, not in big structures, but small structures. So to maintain the comparability of results, use appropriate positioning devices. So the patient's very important that the patient lies comfortable on the PET system, because you know you you lie there and you say, oh yeah, no, that's okay, but something is pressing somewhere here, and after five minutes or ten minutes, it starts to hurt, and then you start to uh, move around, and that means motion artifacts. That's also not good. And uh, always keep an eye on imaging artifacts. So beam hardening due to implants, motion artifacts. So if you know that the patient has an implant, then maybe you can already set in the CT a metal artifact reduction algorithm or something. And also uh, sometimes one can avoid artifacts with the right position. Just an example, because I said uh, acquisition time and injected activity can be an issue. That's uh, also a study student of ours did um, a few years ago. That's <laughs> the same patient, the same uh, glioma in that case, reconstructed with different acquisition times. So you have a 10 minutes, five minutes, and one minute. And you see the 10 minutes is a very nice image. Five minutes still works and the one minute is already very noisy and to delineate that tumor is already quite, let's say, quite challenging. And if you look at the SUV values, especially at the SUV max value, then see uh, that was, a let's say, hey, I, I remember right, around 20 patients that the deviation uh, with five minutes from the 10 minutes can was quite low, like a few percent maximum. So that's fine. So you can do five minutes actually instead of 10 in that case. But if you go to three minutes, two or even one minute, then actually uh, on average, you had a deviation of 15% in the quantitative readings and up to 40% higher SUV max values due to the noise in that patient. So, uh, and even if you use an SUV, um, uh, a mean SUV of uh, threshold defined ROI, then even there, we still had quantification errors with the one minute scans compared to the 10 minute scans of around 12% on average. So uh, too short acquisition time is not good and the too low activity injected is also not good because here one has to say, especially if it goes to lower injected activity. Um, an image you did, which is too noisy to do a proper diagnosis is also a radiation accident because you need to repeat it. So you always should set the acquisition time and the activity you inject in a range that it's appropriate for a good uh, diagnosis and only trying to reduce those uh, just because of the purpose of reducing those is sometimes not the best idea and going to very fast imaging uh, to get a high patient throughput might also not be the best idea if afterwards the image quality is really bad. Good. And then we come to the last step, the evaluation and interpretation. That also needs to be taken into account. So only because you now have the image doesn't mean that you're finished because actually what nuclear medicine or what is done in a PET-CT is an assessment of metabolic activity. 
and that is done with a diagnosis, a diagnostic report. And uh, just an example, I mean, medical doctors are reading that, nuclear medicine specialists, and if you now want to extract a CV value, then you can do that on different, on different ways. One can use the maximum pixel value, that's usually always the maximum pixel value. The problem with the maximum pixel value, it's very influenced by noise. So higher noise means higher SV max, always. And then you can use mean values of a specific region of interest. These are usually the more stable uh, values. But the mean of what? That is also a question. Was it take the mean because it's more stable, but you need to say the mean of what? Because you can do a hand drawn ROI, you can have fixed ROI size like the SCV peak, that's what you see here, uh, or a threshold based region of interest with a threshold of the maximum, or there are a lot of advanced algorithms for delineating. And I did that on that example. That's a meningioma. Not an FDG scan, but it's nice to see here. And you see that if you look at the, the max value for all is the same, that's fine. That's good. In the patient, it's the same, but it's affected by noise. But if you look at the mean value, depending on which drawing one takes, that can go from 8 to 4.5. So the ROI and how one does this SUV reporting is also extremely important. Good. Uh, I hope uh, that was, um, let's say, a nice example on all these steps involved and what should be taken into account if one sets up standardized operation procedures for quantitative imaging in PET, PET CT, PET MR. As I said, the same holds true for uh, quantitative spec CT imaging. So you have similar issues there. And uh, what I can tell you as take home message is in all those uh, examinations for a proper quantification and a proper diagnosis, but especially for a proper quantification, one needs to take into account the whole workflow, which uh, means starting from the instructions for the patient uh, until the finalized report by the medical doctor. And all those steps in between are important to, in the end, get up really a quantitative assessment of a metabolic activity or a functional process in PET. For uh, in PET, especially in, in, in particular, but in general also in all nuclear medicine imaging. Okay. Thanks for that. Uh, for listening and I hope you enjoyed this overview.